is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Well, hi there. Welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we once again continue on in our study of the letter to, of James, and we are now we've been in, we were in the fourth uh, chapter last week, and we'll be starting today at four or five, chapter four, verse five, and we're going to do that right after Alice asks for God's blessing on our time together. Hallelujah. Lord, we do. We praise you. We thank you. We bless you. We thank you for all that you're doing. Lord, we know that you're in control. You are faithful and you never fail. And Father, we ask that you just let this study nourish our spirits and those who have listened to it could be encouraged and grow stronger in you and their relationship with you. And Father, don't let anything come out of Alan's mouth. You haven't put there. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so as I said, we're going to start. Uh, we're going to start in James four five. Pick it up. That's we left it off at, at the end of verse four last week. So I'll start by reading that. Are we ready? You all ready? And rather, let me suggest one more time. You have like something to write a note. Make yourself a note. If, if, if a question arises, if you want to check something out, then you should be able to note that. And of course, it's always a good thing to bring a Bible to a Bible study. Mm -hmm. Test what I say. Make sure that it is indeed the Word of God. Yeah. All right, James 4, 5. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Do you think that Scripture speaks to no purpose? Of course not. I don't think that there's anything that we know of in this world that has more purpose than God's Word. Mm -hmm. So think about this. Think about the purpose of Scripture. Let me read you a couple of things. In John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, it says this. Therefore, many of the signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been write, written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of the Word of God. Life in his name. Life in his name. That you'll believe that Jesus is the Christ. Because the scriptures attest to it every single way possible. And then in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You know what? You need to be aware of the fact that God is watching the intention of your heart, right? Thoughts. Intentions. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want to, in Second Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. This is Paul writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. All scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The Word of God is there to equip you to do the work of God. And you can't, you're can't. you not going to be able to do the work of God with, without having that Word of God in your heart and on your mind and on your lips. So I'm going to read too from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. And by the way, all of the verses that I read typically are from the New American Standard Bible because the ones that I use as a rule are the New American Standard and the King James and on occasion the English Standard Version. Check to make sure that your Bible says something akin to this, at least. Mm -hmm. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, right? Yes. You're not going to be able to take thoughts captive to, to the word to Jesus if you don't know the word of God. Because this is the word of God is an expression of God's thought. So, it's him speaking through us when we speak. Absolutely, the word. absolutely. So let me read you this one too from John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. 
Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You want to know something? There is so much untruth out there. Oh Everywhere you look in this world, there is untruth, which makes sense because it says later that this present world is in the power of the evil one, who is a, the father liar. of liars yeah. and a, a, a liar it. by nature. He yeah. can't say anything that's true. Yeah. So, I mean, you're hearing a lot of things about fake news and everything. If you think you're going to find out what's true news by checking this one against that one, check everything against the Word of God. Test all things and hold fast that which is good. Test them against the Word of God. And then in that, that verse that we're studying, he said, He jealously desires the Spirit He has made to dwell in us. So, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, mm -hmm. in everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. That's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 22. What does it mean to quench the spirit? Well, to quench something, it literally means to put out a fire. You smother it. Well, you put it out. Yeah, turn it off. You, well, you may smother it. You may cool it down. You may remove the fuel. You know. Um, but you you use the analogy of the light switch. It's like turning off the light. That's the power. The Holy Spirit. Yes. When you quench it, you're just turning. This, you're turning the power. You're turning off the power. But I mean, this is why you know Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, "Kindle afresh the, the gift of God in you." Yes. Because, you know, uh, I, I was in the Navy, and anybody that's been in the Navy, I think still, you're trained in firefighting. Mm. Because, like, if you're up in a plane flying, as, as I was, and a fire breaks out. You don't know what to do. Well, you can't call, you can't call, call 999 or 911 and ask them to come out and save you. Mm. Same thing goes on board a ship. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's up to you. So they train you on how to fight fires. And there's a basic rule about fires. The way you put out a fire is either by removing the air, the oxygen, remove the heat, or remove the fuel. Because a fire requires those, those three things. So does the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life. It requires three things. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leaving to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Romans 8, 14 and 15. So, you know, I, what's what's the oxygen? Well, I just read you. Right from, from God. I just read you. Yeah. All scripture is God breathed. It's that, that wind that might, on the day of Pentecost, there was a mighty rushing wind mm -hmm. that fueled the flames of that fire. Yes. It takes heat. You know, we should have we should have a passionate affair with Jesus yes. Christ. I'm telling you. You know, Jesus had to say to what was it that in the first church in Revelation chapter two, he said, You've left your first love. Where's the passion in our love? I mean, love love is not just a, a stick it on the table thing. I mean it's a it's something Do you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> passion. Well it, it is, it's passion. You have to have some fire in your life. You have to have some fire in your love. Yeah. Don't leave your first love, okay? How, what's the fuel? You gotta have fuel. That's one of the things. If you want to stop a fire, take the fuel out of it. Wait a minute. We yeah. are the fuel. <laughs> we are. We're told to present ourselves a living, yes. our bodies a living and holy sacrifice unto the Lord. We're we're the fuel. We've got to offer ourselves on the on the flames of that fire, the fire of the Holy Ghost. Do you concur? I concur. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. If you don't concur, ask the Lord. Amen. I, mean, I pray that as we do these Bible Just studies, that you should, and you should have conversations with the Lord about everything that you're studying anywhere. Now let me move on to verse 6. It says, But he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We have been saved by amazing grace. Hallelujah. So what does it mean? What's a greater grace? <laughs> I 
It says that there are six things that the Lord hates. Yes, even seven, which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, that's where it starts. And that's in Proverbs 6, 16 and 17. Pride is insidious. And it's a gateway for all other sin. It says in, in, in Proverbs that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Proverbs 16, uh, verse 18. You know, what's the difference between pride and haughty eyes? Have you an idea? You can have pride because you think, you know, you've done something so well. Pride is a focus on yourself. Haughty eyes means you have to look down on somebody else. Haughty eyes requires, uh, you know, a, a very negative approach that you have to, it's not just that you're puffing yourself up, you're putting other people down. You're looking down on other people. And you will notice that most people who are filled with pride will do both of those things mm -hmm. because they're pride and haughty eyes, all right? The Apostle Paul was surely a humble man. Yes. Does anybody doubt that? I mean, he even called himself the least of the apostles, right? In 1 Corinthians 15, 9. And he called himself the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy 1. Mm -hmm. And yet, in spite of that fact, I don't know that there were many, many more humble men. I mean, you know, the Bible notes the fact that Moses mm -hmm. was the most humble man in his time. But God had him go out and work with sheep for 40 years before he was ready to work with them. So the Lord found it necessary that Paul be given a thorn in his flesh mm -hmm. to keep him from exalting himself, right. to protect him from pride in his own life. As humble as he was, I said, well, you're not quite humble enough. Mm. Wow. You, you need to meditate on that and think about that. That God saw Paul, well, I want to make sure you don't get uh, unhumble. Well, but because it's such a, a serious, I mean, it's the gateway to all sin. It's the gateway to all sin. Yeah. So that's, that's it. Pride is, you know, puffing yourself up, oily eyes. Requires that you demean somebody else. Down on others. Okay. So, so let's go on to verse uh, 7. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit. Now, people talk about all the things they do. I mean, they're going to want to curse and they're going to go into demon busters. You know what? When you want to win against the devil, here's the plan. Submit therefore to God and resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Because God takes the battle. And I feel sorry for those Christians who are in the habit of running from the devil. Yes. When the devil ought to be running from us. What does it mean to submit? Well, it means Surrender. to place yourself under the control of another. It comes from the Latin, and to yield, to lower, to let down. To yield or surrender to the will or authority of another. Right. Okay. We're not very, human beings are not great at that. I mean, you know, especially if you're not what they call an alpha type, you know, you're, you're a go-getter and you want. It, it's hard for you to put yourself under somebody else's authority and say, well, but it does say, we need not, in Proverbs, we need not on your own understanding. That's right. So if you're, you know, if you think enough of yourself or highly of yourself, you're going to be figuring out what you should do rather than going to the Lord and having him tell you what you should do. Okay? By the way, you're not doing God a favor by submitting. No, of course not. Okay. I mean, somebody, somebody, you know, it's, it's an old thing. I, I came into the family of God. I was saved. And I had been an extremely prideful person. And I was conscious of that, highly conscious of that. And I prayed and I prayed and I said, Lord, you know, take that pride out of my life. And I'm going to tell you, he did. Until I realized that I had become proud of my humility. <laughs> humility. <laughs> Satan is subtle, I'll tell you what, right? So, do you not know that you, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20. You're not your own. When it, when it says in Proverbs 3, not to lean on your own and say, you have no right to do that. No. You need to be motivated and moving by the voice of God, the command of God, the mind of Christ. 
So you don't have the right to figure things out and do them your own way. You don't. So what does that mean? It means you have to, you have to be willing to say, I don't know what to do. When you're pretty darn sure that you do know exactly what to do. Or one of the things I was thinking about is, like if you, you don't know what to do, and you, and you go to the Lord and say, I'm not sure if what I'm doing is from you. So if it isn't, please stop me. And he'll do that. I mean, he'll, he'll honor that. Yes. He'll honor that because that, that's, a, that's a right heart attitude. Right. Okay? I want to be submitted to God. I want to be doing what God wants, not what I want. Exactly. Right? Okay, so that's about submission. Rebellion is the opposite of submission. And rebellion, it says in First Samuel, is as the that's like witchcraft. witchcraft. God sees that as witchcraft. Practicing witchcraft. Because you're, you're, I think t times when you're rebelling, you try to talk the person who has authority over you. You try to talk them out of doing it, and that isn't that like witchcraft? You know, using spells, <laughs> well, words. It, it is using words. I mean, yes. Yeah. The, the thing, I think that we really, we, the family of God, need to focus and understand what rebellion is. Right. It is witchcraft. Right. Because we rejoice in our rebellion more often than not. Right. What's the difference between a rebellion and a revolution? Nothing. They're the same. It's, it's trying to usurp authority. So how many countries in the world do we know of that were not born in rebellion? I mean, even England, which is, has, a, has a monarchy, they have what's called a constitutional monarchy because the power and authority of the sovereign was diluted and taken away back in, I think, in the, around 1080, somewhere around there with the Magna Carta. Here in the United States of America, the United States of America became a country yes. by means of rebellion. Uh, and that may sound harsh. It doesn't matter whether it's harsh. It matters whether it's true. Because rebellion is as witchcraft. Okay. You, but, you, but do you want to know why people won't accept that? Is because they have so much pride in their country. And they have so and, much invested in it. Right. And they can't believe that there's some, they're, do, they're doing something wrong. Well, nobody wants to hear that they're wrong. Yeah. That's part of pride. Of course, yeah. Submitting to God, basically, he says, don't lean on your own understanding because your understanding is not trustworthy. Not at all. That's why we have to have the mind of Christ. The, the prophet Jeremiah said this very succinctly. All mankind is stupid and devoid of knowledge. Isaiah said, the whole head is sick. But you've been convinced otherwise by who? By yourself. Mm. You want to know how you can see what's going on? Look at family life here in the, in the Western world, and you will see rebellion in its fullness. Full what family life? Well, what family life? How many children do you know are truly submissive to their parents? How many? Uh, I'm not going to get into that now. But these are questions that you need to ask yourself. These are things that you need to converse with God about, that you have come to a real understanding of what's pleasing to God. Because if that's not your great desire to please God, you are on the wrong track, headed in the wrong direction, and you're going to wind up in the wrong place. Now, you, you need to understand something, okay? We need to be submitted to God. There will be times when the earthly rulers that God has installed Mm -hmm. because he appoints the rulers, mm -hmm. will ask you to do something that is contrary to Scripture, right. contrary to what God wants. Yes. In which case, you have to stand firmly against that, but not rebel. Don't take action against it. You have to be willing to suffer the consequences of doing it and trust in the Lord. Because they don't have that realm of authority. They don't. They, you know what the authority of a government is? They've been given a sword to protect us from evil doers. That's it, yeah. They don't make religious rules, or they do oftentimes, but that they don't have the right to. Sorry, that's not giving them the A great example of this is uh, when Peter and John refused to obey the rulers and elders in Jerusalem in Acts 4. 
they were being submissive to God. Yes. Because they had been commanded not to proclaim the name of Jesus. By, Jesus. by the, king, the earthly rulers. By the earthly rulers. Yeah. When God had said, I mean, it is clear that our, our ministry, all of us, is to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We need to tell people about Jesus. We need to tell people about the love of Jesus. I don't think that the world is going to like that. Don't think that the world is going to agree with that. Don't think that the world will not try to stop you. But you have to choose who you will obey, okay? It's like if you are at work, this is true to us, if you're at work and they tell you we don't want you to preaching Jesus or talking about Jesus here, and you can say, that's fine. This is your place of business. You have the authority. I quit. Which is exactly what I had the occasion yes, to do. Exactly. <laughs> and it's not like I went to, to, to work just to preach the gospel. No. It was that I know, you know, it says about the word that we've been given everything pertaining to life and godliness mm -hmm. yes. in the word. Yes. So I was sharing things from, from the word of God. And in that effect, because I was sharing it with people that were not saved and who were saved, a lot of the ones who were not saved. How were, to work according to the word of God. Because the word of God is true and faithful. Right. And that showed up in the bottom line of that company. Absolutely. There was such profit. It was in incredible what a time that was. Yes. But still, I, and I reported only to the president, but I was called into the home office, you know, before I had my own offices, uh, and he said, no, we don't want you talking about Jesus anymore. And I said, that's all right. I said, you know, it's your building, it's your business, it's your company. If you don't want me to talk about Jesus, I won't talk about Jesus. But I said, I'd rather go out and pump gas. And I was making a lot of money. I said, I'd rather go out and pump gas for minimum wage and be able to talk about Jesus and stay here. So I quit. They didn't like that. They, they refused to let me quit. They backed down. They backed down. Oh, By the way, Oh, you need to understand that Satan, the enemy, is a bully. Yes. He'll push against you and push against you as much as he possibly can. Stand up. Stand firm. Well, let me see this. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. You don't need to go fleeing from him. And God had you there until he wanted you to leave. You realize that when Jesus went to the cross at the hands of Pilate, mm. What he was doing was being submissive to his father. Yes, yes, absolutely. He so, could have stood there and tried to defend himself, but he didn't. So I think I had mentioned at one point, you know, we should have some homework. Mm -hmm. Why not take some time after this is over and find five things, pick five things that justify rebellion? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Nothing justifies rebellion. Because the answer is nothing justifies rebellion. That's right. Don't lose sight of the fact that in the New Testament times, when the people of God lived under some of the most despotic mm. rulers in history, Tiberius, Sejanus, Caligula, Claudio, Nero, Claudius, Nero, Christ was born in that time. Right. Uh, and when a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that a census be taken of the inhabited earth. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. That's what it says in Luke chapter 2. What would you think? We're living in Florida now. There are no native Floridians. Oh, there, may be, there may be one or two here. Can you imagine if the government of the United States, okay, you said everybody has to go. We want to make sure that our tax records are at. You need to go to your back to your home where you were born, where you were born, and make sure that your tax rolls are correct. Do you how, how do you think anybody rebel against that in, this, in the, our times today? Oh, I would definitely think so. Yes. So did God have Joseph and Mary run away? Or something? No, they He submitted. had them go to the Bethlehem, the family home. Stand firm, trust in God. And be willing to pay the price. Yes, that's the Is there a price? Go read Hebrews 11. Not like, oh boy, what am I going to get? Go read, actually read Hebrews chapter 11 and see what the price may be. Yes. Remember that rebellion is synonymous with revolution. Mm -hmm. You're revolting. I, I might, you know what? Rebellion is revolting. revolting. Yes. <laughs> All right. That's it. I don't have that one, right?
So resist the devil. And people say, oh, you, don't, you don't know what I'm going to do. You don't know what that devil's doing. Do you know that it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. Hallelujah. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now, there's an escape in there, and there's an endure in there. Sometimes he will make us go through the fire. Yes. I mean, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, one of the most beautiful accounts of God's faithfulness. Yes. Amen. But when they were called and told, you must bow down into this statue, of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon yes. and worship it, yes. they said, no. They said, if you don't, we're going to throw you into this fire. And they said, well, you know what? If they were saying, basically, you do what you're going to do. We're going to do what we're going to do. Because yeah. God is God. God is God. And that's what they said. They said, you know, God can deliver us. Mm -hmm. Maybe he won't. But whether he does or doesn't, he's still God. That's right. Is that your attitude? He's still God. I'm going to stand fast. I'm going to stand firm. Don't make excuses because of what you think you're going through. No, I mean, listen, it's, it's common to man. That's what I just read to you. It's common to man. Excuses are the fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. Amen. Stand firm. He'll flee from you. That's what it says. You know, it says that the wicked flee when no one's pursuing. Mm. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. Proverbs 28, 1. Are you bold as a lion? But that boldness has to be just a confidence in the, in the Lord God Almighty who died on a cross to save your life. Remember, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Genesis 126. When Satan, when that serpent came to Eve and said, did God really say, call God a liar. That's, that's what he was doing. He called God a liar. Well, you know the result of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're living the result of that. Mm -hmm. But you, you realize that the word of God is true, and it is. <laughs> she had the authority to say to that serpent, yes, his word is true. That's right. Get out of here. He would have been required to go. Yes. You don't know the power that God has given you when he entrusted you with his word. That's right. When he entrusted you and filled you with his Holy Spirit. Use it. Most Christians don't exercise their authority. And I'm not talking walking around like, well, big shots. I'm talking about, first and foremost, their authority over yourself. Right. The weapon we have is the sword, which is the word of God, yes. which is what Jesus used when he was confronted with Satan. Amen. But we need to understand that we have the authority to take, our spirit has authority over our flesh. That's right. Yes. yes. So, you know, are we not like the woman in the garden when we're doing things and that temptation arises and we give in rather than casting it out? Compromise. God has not given us a spirit of timidity. That's what he wrote, what Paul wrote. Yeah. But of power yes. and love and discipline. Second Timothy 1 7. King James says a sound mind. You have a sound mind. You have a spirit of discipline. You've got to use it. You've got to embrace it. You've got to take control and authority over your flesh. Paul says it's a constant battle between your flesh and your spirit. That's the power we need. We need it for overcoming the flesh. This there's great reward in this, you know. I mean, because the thing is. The next verse in James 4, 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near. What do you want more than the nearness of God? Nothing. Well, I hope not. And how do you obtain the nearness of God? Draw near to him. Draw near to him. Think about the things that you do choose to draw near to him. I mean, what, what occupies your life? What do you choose to occupy your life with? What do you choose to draw near to? His promise is that if you will draw near to him, he will draw near to you. It says in Hebrews 4, 16, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence 
to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4, 16. We have to have that confidence that we can go before the throne of God, the throne of grace. The King James says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Religion has always, it seems to me, kept men away from that throne. Yes. Religion always kept men away, even the Jewish religions established by the Lord, until, until Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Matthew 27, 50 and 51. Mm. He'll draw near to you. Mm. I'm not going to get into this now, but I'll tell you. When that veil was, that massive, massive veil in the temple leading into the Holy of Holies, when it was rent in two, it wasn't let you in, it was let the Holy Spirit out. Amen. We have to be careful. We have to be prayerful about the things that we're doing, the things that we believe. I remember when I was saved, there was a campaign going on, or, or not long after, mm -hmm. called I, I Found It. And I, I trust that the people that came up with this concept and everything have, had good hearts and were trying to do right. But the guy that started it from Campus Crusade said, God performed a miracle there on the day of Pentecost. They didn't have the benefit of buttons and media. So God had to do a little supernatural work there. But today, with our technology, we have available to us the opportunity to create the same kind of internet interest in a secular society. Somebody has improved on the Holy Spirit. Somebody has improved on God's plan. By the way, the thing that troubled me about that right off the bat was Jesus, Jesus is not an it. And he was never lost. And he was never lost. <laughs> he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He oh, found yeah. us. He found us. We didn't yeah. find him. Well, I, I think I've, I'm finding that we have zoomed through our time, too. I've said this before. Don't take my word for anything. Test it. Test it. But more than that, you need to get in a, a, a relationship where you are in conversation with the Lord God Almighty all the time. You can draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And you need to test everything according to the Spirit of God. You need to not quench that. You need to get that fire roaring in your life. I, there's nothing more important than your relationship with the Lord God Almighty, which is what makes your relationship with God the Father, Abba, right. Don't take shortcuts. Don't look for ways around to do it your own way. There's only one way. Jesus said it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you sent your Son to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, mm -hmm. to set us free, free from the slavery and bondage of self, Sleep free from the slavery of bondage and of, of sin. Lord God, that's an accomplished fact. You've done it. All we need to do is receive it. So Lord, I pray that you just continue to work in and through our lives for the glory of your name. And Lord, that we would be excited about your son, Jesus Christ, and the world around us would see that excitement in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Even so, come on, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Well, until next week, join us again. Be back again, right here, same time, same channel. Oh, oh, oh. And come with your Bible, come with your heart prepared to get into the Word of God. Till then, God, God bless, bless you, and goodbye. Bye-bye.